tall cobblers for a reason. The way they walk is very awkward and moving back and forth and kind of almost there's a there's a word the reason i mentioned that word is that we're going to bump into that word in psalm 119 it's dalit lamid pay hey which is similar to dalit lamid uh no to, similar to tet pay tet pay yod tet pay tet pay tough tough or tap tap which is actually a mincing gait like children and so the question is, it also means to a drip or a drop. It's like, what does that mean? And part of looking at Hebrew is like, well, look at the picture that it invokes. How, do, how does a child, a toddler, walk? They're not Olympic athletes. They're toddlers. And is Yahweh going to condemn us, criticize us, smack us all around if we don't take great strides like some cross-country athlete well our our expectation of his favor of if his smiling face upon us is is probably a a, a bigger motivating force than i can even imagine to, to think that you want to bring a, fate, a smile to your parents' face or to your child's face or to Yahweh's face or to your spouse's face, your friend. I mean, just think about that. He designed human psychology. And so we've got the basically the, the carrot and the stick, you know, the motivation out in front of us, the carrot, like you put it dangled in front of the nose of the mule and he runs after it trying to catch it but then you've got the stick which is the uh basically positive and negative reinforcement it's it's the running running from the punishment the adversity and reaching towards the goal and he and he gives us both all through scripture but as long as that we're aiming towards his stuff how much condemnation is he really going to pour out on us and if we're in the position here it is 2021 if we are right now in the position of saying we have to not only change our minds, but change the mind of the, you might say, the entire nation of Israel. And then again, not meaning those guys over there in the Middle East, but the people that choose to be Yahweh's people. We Somehow we are, by even making these vid videos, I believe, instrumental in the light shine on Yahuwah's own words and on his own face for the regard of other people because for centuries I mean Jeroboam that was about 800 BC so here it's been nearly 3,000 years especially since the days of David and that would have been the grandchild uh, generation after David but for 3,000 years, we've had our leaders teaching us how to do it wrong. And whether we have the wrong calendar, whether we have the pronunciation of some of the words wrong, whether even some of the definitions of words is not quite right, to turn hearts and attention and just even your eyes on his words, I don't know if it's ever been done in 3,000 years since David wrote Psalms 119, literally. I mean, some people maybe, but collectively as a group, how do you, how do you affect a change to the entire consciousness of millions of people scattered all across the face of the earth who speak different languages from different cultures? So the task that we are engaged in right here is you have to, you have monumental. To start, you have to first start with changing your own attitude. And lining up with Yahweh. Until you do that, you can't change anything. I can't change you. I can't change uh, uh, Gilen. I have to change myself. And then through my example, hopefully people will see, hey, that's the way to go and go from there. And and stick to it when things are tough. Not just, oh, uh, uh, say it this day. And then when something changes, I change also. You've got to stick with it. Right? And so you got first, the first thing you have to do is change your own attitude. And, and, uh, try to get it to line up with Yahweh as best as you understand. He's like a father. He's not going to punish you if you're trying to walk in his ways. 
uh, as best as you can, as best as you understand, and you ask him, Father, am I doing it right? He'll tell you. He says, ask and you shall receive. Knock on the door will be open. Search and you will find. He's not kidding us when he says that. All right, well, let's start with prayer and uh, get into it. Hey, how you doing? Uh, who's on this call here? Debbie Hall, how are you? Oh, Paul Barry's here too. Hey, Mark and Debbie hi. and Paul Barry. Paul hi. Barry. I don't see you, but hi anyways. Wait, did you correct me on the saying of your last name, Paul? Barry. Hey, hey all. Mike and Debbie here. Hey, Mike. Hey, Debbie. Hello. <laughs> Thanks. Glad to be here, all. Okay, we're shutting so, up now. So, for people that just came on, I'm going to send this to you. We're doing uh, Psalm 119. There's a. I'm going to follow Eric's notes from his page, but I'll send you a link to it right now. And I'll also put it on the uh, a link to it in the uh, comments down below. So we'll start out with Father, thank you for thank you for this past week. Uh, thank you for today. Me personally, Father, I just I'm blown away by you. I'm blown away by how true you are to your words. We don't even have to ask. You give us the needs of our heart consistently. Father, I just pray that we're reminded of this constantly. Everybody knows that you give us without even asking. Father, I pray that you bless this teaching, that this message goes forward, that we're able to learn from it and grow from it. I thank you so much for inviting us to your table, to the Moedim, to inside the head. I just I just love you. In whose name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. There was a person who wrote a note on Facebook, I think it was last week, that they were going through some troublesome circumstances in their life, let's say. And they said, that's it, I'm done, I've uh, lost the race, I'm, I'm out, I'm out. Hit the wall, as it were. Picture of Indianapolis 500 sort of speed race, and one of the cars hit the loses control, hits the wall, just goes flying into pieces. And they're saying, that's me. That, uh, I'm, 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 it's like, what? Why would you volitionally say out of everything I've learned, everything I've experienced, everything that I know about Yahuwah, I'm done with him. I'm just done with him. Well, maybe you... Maybe you feel that way, but does that mean you're out of the race? Or maybe you're in a pit stop. Maybe maybe you can be attended to. That shut up, leave me alone. I don't want to talk about it. Well, okay. One of the reasons for doing these studies, I think, is like we were just talking, Kurt, before we started, which I, I you know, hopefully that'll be part of the uh, what's on the recording. Like Mark was mentioning we we can't change the world unless we change our own mind and we can't help anybody else unless we're first helped ourselves. the airplanes they say okay if if uh, the cabin loses pressure oxygen mass falls down put it on your own mouth first before you help your child if you're not stable you can't help somebody else so I personally believe there's a benefit in looking at, staring at, contemplating these letters, these words. And I've mentioned before that if we just look at the letters, just stare at the orthography, just look at maybe one verse written out, this, what's called the rack card. The reason for that is that sometimes in... Uh, tourist destinations they'll have a rack in front of a lobby and with his various different cards dropped in then this is the exact size and shape so i made this to fit like one of those but it makes a handy bookmark or, or whatever but the idea is to and by the way uh, i've also uh diana up in uh, montana has put on an email at 
Scriptology Prince. That's that's not Prince like the uh, Prince and the Pauper, but it's Prince, P-R-I-N-T-S. Erictology Prince at gmail.com. Go to that email site. You can order one of these cards. And then the idea is on the back is the uh, Elephant song. If somebody reminds me, we could sing that and I can tell you about that later. But the point is, I made this not only as, as this rack card, but also 10 inches by 30 inches. And it fits right up above a window or a door. And I made this back in 2005. And by sticking it up in that, that little space above the framing of a door, up against the ceiling of a typical house with an eight-foot ceiling, interior room, it's always just there. And, in, and kind of in the corner of your eye, if you're sitting there, you can just kind of stare at it. And you're just looking at this. And not even if you're having conscious thoughts. But well, why did I make up that idea to do that? Well, there's a word that's used actually in Psalms 119 a few times and in other verses, which is hey, bet, tet, habet, kind of like a habit. And if you add another, just an easy way to remember, if you add another tet, it's the word pronounced habitat, which literally in Hebrew means the same type of a thing where, where something is found in its, it's translated as the word aspect or to gaze at, or to look at and stare at. That's the exact word. And it's the word used when the people were bitten by vipers back in the, in the Midbar, in the wilderness. And I think it's the book of Numbers. The people were grumbling and complaining and getting a really bad attitude. And it says that Yahweh sent vipers amongst them. You could say, well, the people drew the vipers out Either way, maybe it was the devil that sent them. The point is, a lot of people were getting bit by poisonous snakes and dying and their flesh being inflamed and in great pain. So Moshe called out and says, what should we do? And Yahweh says to make, it's actually not a snake on a pole, which looks very similar to the doctor or medical association emblem, which is actually from what I understand, not a snake on a pole, but it's worms crawling out of, uh, parasites crawling out on this certain type of stick that doctors used to use in the Middle Ages. That's a different matter. But the idea that Moshe put a serpentine shape of glittery copper, kind of shaped like a noon, onto a scaffold-like apparatus, whether it was a pole or a, a pitchfork or some kind of thing that he could stand up with this symbol up above there. So that's very similar to the noon Somic logo. Kurt, you could put the picture of the orange birth noon Somic. It's the Erectology logo. And the reason for that is that because that word spelled noon Somic means to raise up. It also means to be a banner. Idea that Yeshua said, if I be lifted up or the Son of Man be lifted up like just as Moshe lifted up the serpentine shape in the wilderness. So everybody who looks to me will be saved. Well, that word looked is hey bet tet, which is to gaze at the aspect or somehow stare at to the point that you comprehend the aspect, the, the visual Somehow the utterance, even, the word utterance is re a related word to that, if you look in the dictionary. Aspect of utterance. The word aspect is something visual. Utterance is something that's spoken auditory. That's, that's like looking at the meanings of the letters. The same idea as staring at the letters, looking at the spelling of the words, the shape of the letters, the writing of sentences, literally is the exact same meaning as Moshe lift up this noon on a summit in the wilderness and whoever got bit by vipers will be saved. They will recover. This is the antidote. And so Yeshua to be lifted up is also similarly the same type of antidote. So, you know, we might, you know, people have said some things 
people have said some things regarding getting, uh, let's say, stung by vipers in your in your arm of what's going on and saying there's no recovery. It's a, a doomsday scenario. Is that true? I don't know. You hear different stories. But all I can say is if there was any antidote to being stung by the let's let's say metaphorically there's a picture in revelation of these long-haired faces like lions tails like scorpions coming out of a the bottomless pit and attacking people stinging them if there was any antidote even for, for those creatures it would be to stare at these letters the word aleph Tav Noon and Yod Tav Noon have to do with a tonic by which one can gain strength to recover. So my suggestion that we stare at these letters is not some sort of occultic woo-woo. It's scriptural. It's, it's applying what I see as definitions of words situationally used throughout scripture if we just read the word aspect to to look at you know it's like we 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 don't necessarily get these words into our consciousness so what i'm trying to do by this particular of psalm 119 this particular study or these various other things we've done is look at the words in a way that maybe sneaks up on onto our conscious focus sideways or sneaking around the it's like whoa i didn't think about that or regard that it's like well think about it regard it whether or not we are a hundred percent accurate or whether somebody else has a better translation i'm not even contending for that status we're just saying yahweh said to look at his words and letters to listen to his voice and he gave us two means by which to listen to his voice. Remember, he spoke on the top of Mount Sinai. So we hear his words. But then he wrote with his finger so we can see the writing of the letters. That's what he gave us. And then he said for us to write these words on the doorpost of our house. Well, does that mean we should write them ourselves? Or does that mean we should get somebody else to write them and buy it and just nail it on the door? And if we were to buy it, and the word door post is mezuzah, so the little thing that they uh, call a mezuzah, that they write some words, stick it inside, nail it on your door post. Does anybody ever open that up and read what's inside? Some people might. That would be something worth doing, is to learn to, to ca cause yourself to be literate to learn how to read these words, and even if it's just these 22 letters, and, and to have this above your door frame up against the ceiling where it catches the corner of your eye, so you just sit there and look at it and stare at it, is the concept of a mezuzah, is the concept of the zitziot, is the concept of chabet, ha habet where we gaze and look at the noon psalmic, because like I say, that if for Yeshua to be lifted up as the living one on the, you might say the cross, the crucifix, that's a noon on a psalmic. The serpentine shape on some kind of pole, that, that's a noon psalmic. But again, like the study of the word hasna, which is the bush, is that the fact that the shape of the letters means something. Well, the shape is the psalmic, that's the engineered structure, like a trellis, and the fact that it that the shape is specific and that it means something, the meaning is the noon, the, that, that spark of mental activity within your own mind, and the fact that with the word bush, hasna, is that the first letter, hey, is this, you might say, ordained or appointed incoming light from the creator who determine this language to be his own expression so that that incoming hay from another source pointing to the letters the stomach and the noon the engineered structure and the fact they have meaning and the fact then that they can express 
what that means to human consciousness out the other side is the other hay. So when we did that logo, you can put the picture up of the Hasna, the Noon Samic, or the Samic Noon with wings. That's what that's about. It's it's the realization, and it just literally is translated the bush as in Exodus 3. To realize that it was as a word, the bush literally is what spoke to Moshe, drawing his consciousness to the fact, I believe, that's what this study is, or I surmise, I should say, that there was an appointed meaning to the shape of the letters, which it, which then contacts and communicates with human consciousness. And when Moshe saw that, he could have at that time, though it doesn't say so in the narrative, he could have determined or calculated as an ingenious work, a hat sheen bat, the entire Semitic alphabet it was already existing as a spoken language, but not necessarily written. Or he could have refined it. I'm just saying that's a whole other study that linguistic authorities may contend with. We won't get into that, but I think it's uh, entirely possible just based on the meaning of hey, Samic noon, hey. So I'm saying that because. To stare at the letters, then, is to habet hasna, which he told us to do. And it has benefit. So even if you're illiterate, you can look at the shape of the letters individually. You can look at the letters in the particular order that they are. And there's people who said, well, the alphabetic order is random, arbitrary non-specific and just happened to fall into this order of collection but it might have been different no i disagree that's not true one of the reasons is because it lines up with the seven days of creation right here in the middle between het and zadi and it lines up with the moedim and you can synchronize the first seven letters aleph through zion to then the het through zadi and in Psalm 119, David locks it in with 22 letters. No letter Chayan as a second letter of what we would call the Ion or the letter O, uh, the, the Omicron in Greek, the letter after Psalmic and before Pei. So there's not 23 letters. There's not a bunch of other letters. According to what David wrote in Psalm 119, there's 22 letters. And according to the pattern, it all fits. But what I'm saying is that there's a great value in just staring at this. And so the uh, the idea that we uh, that uh, when I was up in Montana, there's the uh, Clackamas Copy Center has a PDF file of this being 10 inches by 30 inches. I think they sell it for probably eight bucks a square foot or something like that. So $25, $30. But the, the, these rat cards, we're going to, Diana will send them to you if you want, if you email her. The idea is to say, why should we stare at this language? We're not just saying learn a foreign language. We're saying this is the consciousness of the kingdom of Yahuwah, to restore the kingdom of heaven. A kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's right there in the tefillah being the prayer of our father to our father, as Yeshua told us. What does that look like? What does that mean? And the fact that the American culture is is anchored by the celebration of its festival days, its its holidays, pretty much one every month. You know, people have decorations and parties and themes, retailers. It, it keeps the thing going. So does the kingdom of heaven. So the Moedim, the festivals of listed in Leviticus 23, besides the weekly Shabbat, there are these seven festivals which drive the consciousness of Israel being a nation, not the secular nation in the Middle East, but Israel, the collective confederacy of the 12 tribes, who is Yahweh's special Kadoshim Elionin, the betrothed of the Most High, the sacred special set-apart ones like no other, 
belong to, the personal property, the, who have the personal attention of his gaze upon us, as we gaze upon his matters of the Most High, Elion. This is big stuff. The idea of taking these letters in sequence order, and we're on in this uh, occasion today, we're going to do the first 11, which would be Aleph through Kaf, and then next week, the intention is to do Lamed through Tav, so as to not make this particular discussion too long. But so let me let me say what the nature of this study is in Psalm 119. Back in 2011, it might have been on the, the week of the letter Kaf, I don't recall. But anyway, at the Erectology class in 2011, I ran through this study because that's when I first conducted it. I'm going to suggest this is to be a very unusual study. In that, if anybody's ever done a study of Psalm 119, you'll, you'll notice that it's in Hebrew, you might say compiled completely different than the English scriptural text. Most Bibles just have a bunch of verses. Some English Bibles categorize Psalm 119 into 22 sections of eight verses each. And some of the English Bibles, not all, but they will tell you that the first section is called Aleph, the second section is called Bet, third section called Gimel, and so forth. It's the names of the Hebrew letters in alphabetical order. But you don't know why they're called that. Well, in Hebrew, the letters are numbers. So Aleph basically is one. It can also mean 1,000, but Aleph is number one. Okay. Bet is number two. Gimel's number three. So they're kind of like numerical headings. The first section is Aleph. The second section is Bet. The third section is Gimel. The fourth section is Dalit. And so someone could read, okay, this is just telling us using the letters as titles, which, which section we're reading about. But there's no other particular correlation. But in Hebrew, there's another matter. The first word of every verse in Psalm 119 starts with the first word, the first letter, is the letter of that group. So you can only see it if you have a Hebrew text. So, in other words, the first word in the first section of Aleph is spelled Aleph Shin Resh Yod, pronounced Ashri. Starts with an Aleph. The first word of the second verse starts with an Aleph. It's also Ashri once again. Then the first word of the third verse is Af, which is Aleph Pei. The fourth word is Ata, Aleph Tav He. The next word in the fifth verse is Achli. Aleph Het Lamed Yod, sixth, Aleph Zion, seventh, Aleph Vav Dalet Kaf, and then the eighth verse is Et, Aleph Tav, but it's hyphenated to Het Kuf Yod Kaf. Now, I don't know really why some words are hyphenated and some aren't. I don't know for sure whether the paleo ancient writings of the scripture had hyphenated words. I have no idea. But for the sake of this study, the words which are hyphenated, I've left as if it was a consideration of one word. So the last word, which would be the first word of verse 8 in the first section of Aleph, would be et chokika, not just Aleph Tav. So the second section in the bet section, the, the word is bakal, it starts with the letter bet, but then it's hyphenated with lavi, bakal lavi. So for this study, I'm taking the hyphenated words and looking at them as if they were one word, which is the same, you might say, staging or model of what I was trying to do regarding the shields for the uh, card game. The hyphenated words just regarding them as one word. Totally tangential point, but just bringing that as a reference. So the idea then, if you read it in Hebrew, you'll notice that in the Aleph section, every verse 
starts with an aleph. And in the bet section, every verse starts with a bet. Gimel, every verse starts with a gimel. Dalet, every word starts, every, the first word of, of each verse starts with a dalet. But you won't find that in English. Not only do they transpose the letters, but in English, they reshuffle the word order. So if you tried to look in English, you won't even find that the first word of the sentence is the first word in Hebrew. Sometimes it's halfway through the sentence, they'll stick the first word, which in Hebrew would have been way back to the beginning. So if you try to conduct this type of study in English, you're not going to get it. All you're going to get in English is the, you might call it the narrative value or the concept of what David was trying to say, kind of, sort of. The gist of what David was trying to talk about is what comes through in English. But the poetic, artistic, specific of why did David use those words and why did he put them in that order and why did he phrase the sentences the way he did is absolutely completely lost in English. So, you know. Friend of mine years ago, hey Leo, met some fellow in uh, the, on the streets of New York. He used to do street evangelism where he'd accost someone and wouldn't let them go until they were on their knees begging for forgiveness, ask Jesus in their heart before he'd turn them loose and then they'd be on their way. He said half the time he didn't know if they, they just did it to get him off their, him off their back. But uh, nevertheless, what I'm saying is that there was, a, there was an occasion when he was talking to somebody and the guy says, hey, did you know there's this, there's, you can read the scripture vertically, not just reading the words of the sentence in horizontal lines. And it's like, what? Yeah, yeah, you can read the letters down. It's like, are, the words, are you insane? I mean, who is it that actually orchestrates the, the look of writing on the page? Is it the publisher? If you see handwritten Torah scrolls, yeah, there's columns, but are you suggesting that you should be able to get a, a Torah scroll and read the first word of every line vertically? Are you are you some kind of moronic idiot? Shut up. I don't even want to hear this. Well, that's exactly what we're doing with Psalms 119. Imagine that. In, in verse 18, David says, open my eyes that I may see the paleo, the nephilot. It's the word paleo with a plural suffix and a noon prefix, where you go to the word nephal, as in the word nephilim, which is the giants that fell. It's the word nephlot, which means hidden secret wonders in your Torah. David knew that there was some amazing secrets hidden in the Torah, but he didn't know what they were. In verse 18 of Psalms 119, David says, Yahoo, will you please open my eyes? I, I can't get there on my own, but they're, I know they're in there. And so I've proposed this question before. Yahweh might have said, forget it, David, you're making stuff up. There is no hidden secrets. It's all right there in front of you. So just read what I told you and do what I said. Or in which case, there's no further study. But maybe Yahweh said, gee, David, yeah, now that you've asked, I will show you a few things. If David goes, wow, hey, look at that, would David have then passed it along, like handling the baton to a relay? Would David have said, hey, I'm going to keep a record of these things, and I'm going to write them down so that my future generations of fellow studious, studious with interest regarders of the Torah, that they'd have this? But where would he put it? Did he put it clearly and blatantly? I don't see anything either in this psalm or anywhere else where David said, here, let me tell you all the great things that are in the Torah. Let me tell you exactly what they are. And if you read Psalm 119, he goes over it saying, your Torah is wonderful. Your Torah has all these benefits, but he never tells us what are the hidden mysteries. Then one day back in 2011, as I was looking at this stuff, I thought, wait a minute. 
I didn't even know you could you could see that there was eight words that started with the letter Aleph and then eight words starting with the letter Bet and then eight words starting with the letter Gimel. But what if you could read those as if they were a sentence, but read them vertically like this guy in New York was saying, though he never specified what he meant? What if? So this is my own subjective study. I've told a few people it over, about it over the years and other people have tried to conduct it and come up with similar but different things. And I've sat down half a dozen times and each time different frame of mind, you'd see things a little differently. So this isn't like, oh, this is the translation, but as a pondering, as a habet, a gazing at, might David have hidden the secret mystery of the paleo, the nephalot? Remember, he was a wordsmith. He was a poet. He was a a songwriter, might David have put together as a piece of poetic art 22 sentences of eight words per sentence, each word starting with the letter of that next letter in the alphabetic section? So in other words, the first sentence would read, I mean, forget for a moment all the everything else David said in the rest of the verse, but just read the first word of each verse. It would be Ashri Ashri Af Ata Achli Az Odeka et Chokika. Eight words starting with Aleph. The next sentence would be Bama Bakalavi Belavi Baruch Bashofati Baderek Be Fakadika Be Chok. Tika. Every word starts with the letter bet. The, the next section, Gimel, starts with the word Gimel, Gal Aini, Gar, Garsa, Gaarat, Gal, Gam, Gam, and Tika. Every letter starts with a Gimel. And so there'd be 22 sentences. Now, what I would suggest is if you want a homework assignment, take it upon yourself to do this study. And I would dare say by the time you got done, you would be much more adept than you are to begin with. And if you look up every one of these words in the Ernest Klein's dictionary, which we've talked about many times, and just for the people that have an interest... Anyway, if you don't have clients, look them up in Strong's Concordance or Brown Driver Briggs or whatever you got. Look up each one of these words. Write them down in paleo. Write them with your own hands. There's a connection between the hand and the brain. If you write typing, it'll be different than if you write the letter shapes. Follow the shape, the orthography, the psalmic value of every word with your own hand. It'll log into your physical brain matter. And then, as another part of the study, if you look at what David said for each of the following iteration of the verse, it reinforces it. Though, for the sake of this particular study, we're not going to get into the, that. I'll do it for the letters uh, Aleph, maybe in Bet, but that's, that, that would just take up a whole bunch of time, which would be great to do, but I'm suggesting you do it on your own. So, for example, if we look at the Aleph section, Ashri, Ashri, Af, Ata, Akli, Azo, Deka, Et, Chokika. What I'm suggesting is that if David in verse 18 says, open my eyes, and they were opened, and he did see something, and he decided to leave us a hidden treasure, which nobody else could abscond with, or change or run away with because it's hidden treasure, hidden secret treasure. The treasure map is the alphabet. And only then, if you look at these words in Hebrew, will you find the treasure. So in English, it might say, praiseworthy is the man, or happy is what David said. No, he said Ashri. Wow, it means praiseworthy or happy. It doesn't matter. Well, it does matter because David said Ashri. 
And he said it twice. Ashri, Ashri. But what does Asheri mean? So now you have to start learning the language a little bit. If you look up in the dictionary, you'll see that Aleph can be a prefix, Yod can be a suffix. So the root in between is Shin Resh, Sar. You might have heard the phrase Sar Shalom, which is Prince of Peace, which I believe is used in Isaiah 6. It's also used as words of a song, Sar Prince. But Sar is also a singer, a poet, and it's a bracelet chain. So you think of a really, call it a dainty bracelet, like a charm bracelet. You go on a vacation, you get these little souvenir charms as little reminders. It's like letters of the alphabet. A bracelet is this delicate, beautiful reminder. Like the letters of the alphabet. Put to poetry, put to song, put to a beautiful habitat. A beautiful staging, a beautiful framing. Kind of like putting it into an array, like a bracelet chain, or making a song out of it. To the tune of Itsy Bitsy Spider. Again, remind me before we're done, I'll sing it. But the point is, that's what this is. That's trying to live into the concept of the word Ashri. Not just praiseworthy is the man, or Blessed is he, happy, but it's saying, what is Asher? Asher is a derivative of Yishar, Yod Shin Resh, which is the first three letters of the word Israel, which means straight, level, smooth, plumb, low, square, even, honest, right, righteous. It's all those synonym words. And I know that some people don't like that idea and have expressed so. It's all a matter of studying the spelling of words. And if you have a log jam, in your mind's flow, that doesn't make this wrong. And if you can qualify your log jam as being legitimate and authorized because other people have said so, it doesn't make them right. It just means certain things have been hidden for centuries. And either we can look at every word, letter by letter, every two letter pairs, every three letter triplets, and then to be able to read the words as if they were themselves. One word is a poem. One word is its own melodic song. Each word is a picture composed of other pictures. If you can't do that or you don't want to do that, that's fine. Nobody's saying you're going to burn in hell if you don't. Nobody's saying you're going to be ejected from the kingdom if you don't. But then for anybody to pick up and say, hey, you can't do that, that's wrong, you're making stuff up. It's artistic poetry. You're right, we're making stuff up. So did David. We are trying to, as we were saying earlier, and the reason why we, I was talking about that subject, Mark, before we, uh, or Kurt, before we started was we are trying to correct the consciousness of an entire nation of 12 tribes of inherited thousands of different languages and cultures over th close to 3,000 years of being scattered across the face of the earth. And I believe that the mechanism, the means by which to have a cohesive consciousness is to go back and look at these 22 letters in their aspect of chronological order keyed to the Moedim and factored as if they were variables, factored according to the gospel narrative story that Yeshua is the Mashiach, the Mash, the tangible Shiach communication, the tangible communication. This word in the flesh is Yeshua, otherwise known as Mashiach, tangible communication given to, sent to as leader of Israel. And the way to do that is to look at these things. So if somebody else says, I don't like the way you're doing it, then it's like, fine, make up your own way. Do it your own way. I don't care. We're doing it this way because it actually works. And if you don't think it works, give it a try and prove that it works or it doesn't work. I'm not trying to argue with anybody, just so you know. 
But the word ashri means I will sar my, for myself. Aleph, I will, shin resh, prince, poet, captain, minister, bracelet chain, minstrel, yod suffix for myself. And in so doing, I will become blessed. Praiseworthy? Who's going to praise me? Maybe my own dog. I don't know. But if nobody praises me, that's not the point. The point is, how does one become praiseworthy? Well, that's represented by the letter Resh. Resh is a praiseworthy, exalted, honorable man. That's the meaning of the letter S, or Resh. And then the, the letter Sheen, Ash, Aleph Sheen could be translated fire, but Sheen is teeth or consume. So you could say, I will consume these matters and appropriate them to my own stature of nobility, of honor. And I will then conduct myself as a Ish Israel, a man of Israel who cannot be put to blame for being some sort of jerk. And I will take the burden upon myself to live my life according to the status where my father will look at me and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, my son. And whether anybody else agrees or thinks that this is appropriate or thinks that I'm being some infidel, heretic, heathen apostate, it's not your regard. It's my father's eyes that I have to live unto. That's in the word Ashri. And then if you look at the rest of the sentence for that particular first verse, it says Tamim Derek. Well, the word Tav Mem, Tom is where the word perfect Mayim, that's water, but Imi is daily. Derek, that's the word for way, path, journey. Ahaleka, halaka is, is walking, so this is walking the journey, walking the way, perfect water, that's almost like you picture a ship on a certain course, not just foot walking along a path, but then the Torah, Yahuwah, well, the, the Torah, that's where we get the word tour or go on a tour, which is something circular, like where we get the word tire, a wheel, tour means to, like going on a tour where you like the, um, tokens on a bracelet, sightseeing, investigating. Lewis and Clark went on a certain tour of explore, uh, exploration all the way from St. Louis to Astoria on the Oregon coast and back again, the first pioneers to map out that course. Well, this is the word translated of your Torah. Well, ta Torah is Tav Vavresh Hey, This is Bet Tav Vavresh Tav, Torot. Well, the, there's no vav tav, but that's literally the way they spell the, the plural. So then you have to look and say, well, the, the real word there is or, vav resh. Well, aleph vav resh is light, but vav resh basically is light. And then you've got manora, ora, aurora. Those, you look at English words that are similar, and gold is oro in Spanish. But So there's this playing of spelling and phonetics. And you realize for somebody to tell you, oh, this means with your Torah, Yahweh. It doesn't say that. It says, but Torah, Yahuwah. Does that mean I'm, I'm touring, I'm going on tour through Yahuwah's writings? Sure, but it, it, he's going to enlighten. I'm going to read their sentence back, backwards. Yahweh will enlighten as we search and explore a walk in the way of then you might say perfect waters. Now we're blending water with light. That's what he did on day one of creation. The, apparently there was waters of the deep, and he said Yahi or in the blending of water and light, everything you might say spawned from there. What I'm saying is that you can sit there and look at these words, frontwards or backwards. You can pick these words apart 
with prefixes and suffixes, and you can find the root word, and then your mind can wander with other applications and other verses and other spellings, and it's all fair. It's all perfectly legitimate because it's habet. It's, it's gazing at the habitat, which is the environment that the letters live, like setting up a terrarium or an aquarium, or a flat earth with a dome over it. I mean, set up your own garden where these letters grow, and then just watch them as they blossom, as, the, as other insects and birds and other creatures find their way into your garden. It's your life. You have to ashri, you have to conduct for yourself how to become resh status. Nobody else can do it for you. By talking about this stuff, we are simply trying to say, here's how you build your own garden. Here's how you walk the path of Yahuwah's garden, his Aleph Bet. Here's how you be Israel. But if you want to come up with a better way, have at it. So let's carry on. That's just that's just the first word, Ashri. The second word, Ashri, second, second verse is Ashri, then it says Natsri, that's Nun Zadi Rash Yod. So Natsar, you've heard of the Natsarim, that's Nun Zadi Rash, that's that word there. Yod suffix means I myself or my Natsar. Then I and Dalit Tav Yod Vav. So I and Dalit. Tav would be Ayandalit is testimony. Ayandalit Tav would be the plural form, even though there's no Vav in there, and sometimes there is. And then it says Bekal Lav, that's with all heart. And then Yod Dalit Reshin Vav He Vav. Well, if you know prefixes and suffixes, it's Yod is means he will. Vav He Vav is the suffix, but then the root word is Drash Drash Dalit Reshin. Well, that's that's intensive study. So you could say intensive study of what? So he's referring in verse two about what he said in verse one, which is touring the Torah as learning how to walk the path of then you could say, well, the, the perfect waters or like walking the path. I, I can almost picture somebody skiing, being pulled behind a speedboat. You know, they're not walking on the water, but kind of they're smooth being dragged right behind and you putting these pictures together the word aleph pay the third word off means nose or it can mean anger or wrath but the word yod aleph pay or aleph pay yod even you could see that it means to be characterized so that somebody's nose is what gives character to their face different nose different face different different personality and then it says low Lamed Aleph, which means not, pay Ayan Lamed Vav, and then Ayan Vav Lamed. Hey, well, Ayan Vav Lamed is iniquity. So Paul, like Paul, like Paul Bari, Shaul changed his name to Paul. Why? Well, because it was Roman and he didn't want to be known as that Jewish uh, guy. Eh, I don't think so. The word Paul, pay Ayan Lamed, literally means to be pushed into something or coerced or drawn into it. And just like Paul, uh, the apostle got knocked off his horse, that blinding light voice speaking to him, why are you persecuting me? He's like, well, because of that event, he was induced or compelled to change his life and act differently because of what he saw, because of what he heard. So that's that same word here. But here it says, not pushed or attracted by iniquity. Well, what Aleph Pei characterized So who are you? If somebody says, hey, you want to you want to go rob a bank? No, I have no interest. Well, you want to go rob the 7-Eleven? No, I have no interest. I'm not going to do that. Hey, you want to go get drunk and beat people up? No, I don't want to do that. I'm not going to, I'm not induced, I'm not seduced by iniquity. I don't want to be that person. But and we can do the reverse. We can see what David said as as supplemental to the reading of seven. But here's the point. If I read the seven words, 
Ashri, Ashri, Afata, Achlia, Zodeka, Et Hokika. And then I just define those words. What I end up with, Ashri, could be read as who will be blessed? Who, who would, because the word Asher also means who, that, or which, W H I C H. So I could say who would be blessed? Who wants to be a Resh man? status who wants to be a prince a yashar of elohim af characterized by aleph tov hey is simply translated y-o-u you but aleph tov means to be joined and then hey is to express so i could say characterized by expressing aleph tov well what's aleph tov now you have to define that which is the meaning of these 22 letters which Yahweh says is basically himself, what Yeshua claimed to be in the book of Revelation, the fourth of seven words in Genesis 1 1. Then it says, Achli. Well, Aleph Ket, that's the word for brother. Ket Lamed is, is common or profane. Lamed Yod is my. But Achli, Achal means wish or desire. It's like I really crave this. Aleph Zion means then at that time. Odeka. Well, they'll tell you in the dictionary that that means, well, the root is Havav Dalit, like Hod, like Hodo, Hodula Yawaki Tov, but Aleph means I will, and then you, Y O U is the suffix cough, but Odeka means I will praise you. That's what they say. But A U D is where we get the word in English audio. Well, that's the voice. This can be your voice. One way to read this, et hokika, well, het kuf is command, so hoki is I command, then you, uh, the, 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 you as you have commanded, the aleph tov of you commanded, back up, who would be blessed, who would be blessed, picture a guy out on the street, like one of those old, uh, we call him a herald, saying, hear ye, hear ye, does anybody want to get blessed? Does anybody want to aspire to the resh status, thus making your time on earth a race well run? Be characterized by expressing Aleph Tav as I wish. Who's saying that? Is it Yahuwah calling our attention? At that time, at your voice, at the sound of your voice, Aleph Tav. You command. You command. Why, if I wrap my mind around this, this is almost like David is saying that the, that the great mystery that was revealed to him by Yahweh is Yahweh saying he's not trying to drive us like, mo like motorized robots who have no self-will, not like puppets on a string or only move as he pulls the string, but just like we were saying that when Paul was given opportunity, I mean, uh, King Saul was given opportunity and he spun out of control and crashed and burned. That was on Saul. When Jeroboam was given uh, an offer and Jeroboam says, uh oh, I can't do what Yahweh said or else I will lose everything. Well, he did opposite of what Yahweh said and he went ahead and lost everything. So too, as we hear and then as we speak, if we walking in Yahuwah's covenant of Aleph Tav, characterized as him that's what it means to be of the resh man status you might say that we are characterized by the meanings of these 22 letters which miles jones says means nothing according to that book the writing of god which go ahead and read the book it's a good book other than i disagree with that but the point is if these 22 letters are the very very character and nature of our elohim and the very manifestation of Yeshua, the Mashiach of Israel, is according to what these 22 letters mean, then as a bracelet chain, having these 22 letters, or as Hugo Lamontagne has uh, made the 22 blocks with these colors up in Quebec there, for us to look at these and make them our own and become the manifest of these 22 letters just the same way Yeshua did, then our voice, as it expresses Aleph Tav, apparently is authorized from on high to declare that something be, and it will be. Like, for example, when Goliath was pounding his chest and saying, 
why would they send some punk kid with sticks and rocks like I'm some dog? I'm going to eat your head off your neck. And David says, I'm taking your head in a, just a couple minutes from now, and the birds will eat your flesh, which is what happened. David said it, and it happened. Something about speaking Yahuwah's words, something about speaking Aleph Tav Hade. And when it's the wish of Yahuwah, our Elohim, it'll happen. And that seems to be what's being said here. And for David to take these matters to heart and realize this Aleph Tav that Yahuwah gave Israel, there's nothing like it. It's unprecedented. It's beyond calculation. And we don't even know. We thought it was done away with. We thought it was a dead language that's been trashed by the centuries. And we have no regard. We were given no regard. We were taught no regard. And yet we're here doing these videos to shine the light of regard. Such the world has never seen. But David had a glimpse of. There you go for part one.